This is the Bold City Podcast. Hey, what's up? Welcome to the Bold City Podcast. I'm Jason Masters, the lead pastor at Bold City Church. Today, you're in for a treat, but really quickly, man, I want to remind you guys, if you want to connect with us in any capacity, feel free to visit us at boldcity.church. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. Um, You can find us all over the place, but we'd love to connect with you. If you like what we're doing with these podcasts and these videos, we would love for you to like them and subscribe uh, either on Apple or YouTube or wherever you're watching these. Um, Also, if you believe that these videos or this video in particular that we're about to to give you could help impact anyone in a great way, and we just want to encourage you to share them with your friends, your family, on your social media, uh, because I can promise you this, I am letting you in uh, to somebody that's in my inner circle that is great, that has greatly impacted me this year. I want to welcome our guest, uh, Dr. Jock. Hey, Is how it okay? are you? Yeah. I like saying it, Dr. Jock. Dr. Jock, Doc Jock. Yes. So Jock D. Bruckert yes, sir. is the actual name. And uh, at the end of the podcast, we're going to let you guys know how you can connect with him. He has graciously made himself available to that. Uh, but man, pretty cool to have you here sitting across the table yeah, from well, me. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, well, it's it's an honor. Thanks for coming. Uh, I think it's important because the, I know other people might watch this, but I'm really introducing you to the church uh, that I pastor, and so I want to let them know how we met, and uh, and then we'll kind of we'll get into it. We'll let them know what you do, how that's been impacting me, yeah. which ultimately has really been impacting them, and maybe they didn't even know it. Um, but it's pretty cool to see how God's linked that all together. So at the end of last year. Uh, I really knew that God was calling us to um, to partner with a ministry that really impacted the Jewish community globally. And uh, and as I began to research that, began to interact with people who were in that whole world, man, I encountered your amazing wife, who Tiffany and I love so dearly, Rebecca. And I'm sure you love her too. I love her too. <laughs> yeah, yes, she's, I do. <laughs> she's awesome. And uh, at the end of last year, we started talking and we made a decision to partner with the ministry that that she currently works yeah. for. And uh, and then we decided at the beginning of the year, like, hey, it's wise for Rebecca to come down to share with the church, let them know what they're giving to, what they're partnering with. And she was like, hey, I'm bringing my family. I really want you to meet my husband. And uh, we were excited to meet you. And, uh, and you guys came down, we had dinner, we hung out, we found out what you did for a living and, uh, we thought it was cool. But then you guys were like, Hey, listen, if you ever need anything like on that end, like, man, feel free to reach out. And, uh, I remember you sent me a text that was pretty awesome. That was encouraging and made yourself available to me. And I thought it was awesome. But then, you know, Got going, got busy with ministry. Yeah, time goes by. Time goes by. And I hit this spot, which maybe we'll talk about a little bit on this today, where it's like, man, I I really need some help navigating um, my life, my past, my thought life, and what's currently going on. And, uh, And man, and I reached out and you were like, let's start talking. And so, um, so why don't you tell the people what you do? Well, I'm I'm a uh, private practice psychologist. That that to those people who don't know what that means is, I have a office and I see people, right? Um, and I've been doing that for uh, close to 19 years now. Um, and and my specialty is working with people who have trauma. Let's put it that way, like trauma, right? But they come to me generally because they have some kind of an addiction issue going on, and it's right now it's. Fentanyl, heroin, alcohol, marijuana. That's like the, the prevalent one. Um, and when I started doing that work, uh, it, it, I didn't actually start doing it with addiction. Mm-hmm. It was just general counseling and I was trying, you know, just see who I could see. But what, for some reason, I don't know why it just resonated with me or resonated with my clients, their their experiences of, of addiction. And then word of mouth kind of spreads around. It's like, who can help me with addiction? And then that's how that that kind of started. Um, but what I 
found when I was working uh, with with clients that had these addiction issues that addiction was not really the problem. That was the symptom of the problem. And what is the problem? Really severe trauma. And it was undiagnosed a lot of times, un unrecognized. And the people that were um, uh, getting treatment from other therapists or maybe they're going through rehab or whatever, the, the, the revealing of that trauma was not happening uh, easily with them because it's a source of embarrassment or, or upset, a shame, um, or anger. Anger is a big, uh, a big barrier to it. And so their, their recovery from their addiction was never really taking a good, strong footing. You know, it didn't, it didn't have that footing because it was not, the foundation of their addiction was not being discovered. So they would stop the behavior for a while, maybe it would be months or maybe a couple of years, and then they'd go right back to it again. And that's what we talk about. Uh, addiction is the, the, the chronic relapse condition. Um, and and I, I really wanted to try to stop that. Part of it was because of my background uh, with, with addiction um, and in my family and how much it destroyed my family and, and tried to kill me, uh, honestly. And so trying to understand like people's problems with their, with their stories. Um, I, I really felt like they didn't, they didn't get what they needed. Yeah. So I started kind of taking that on and through the years that became the thing that I really took seriously going through my doctoral program, my PsyD program, uh, addiction is pretty much all I really focused on, um, you know, and, and writing a book about it essentially. Um, and, and I came to realize through, discovery, research, learning, um, experience, what really was going on with people and, and why they weren't getting the help they were getting. So I have, you know, my, my mentor heroes of, of the psychology world and psychiatry world, I started really kind of looking at what they were doing too. And they were finding the same things. Um, so that's, that's what I do. Um, hmm. and, and so I'm really a specialist in trauma, not really addiction, but it's addiction. Right, because yeah. that's why. Well, yeah, because addiction kills you. Trauma 100%. tortures you. <laughs> that's kind of how I, I look at it. That's, I, I know you laugh right there, but that's deep stuff. Like that's that's true, man. And I think um, one of the things in spending really a lot of time with you over the past three months. I mean, every week we meet and talk. Um, we do a really good job of hiding our trauma or dismissing it mm -hmm. or pretending it's not there. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I think one of the greatest things, one of the greatest gifts that, that God has given me this year, particular, particularly in you, is somebody to help take me on a little tour through my life and expose things that I know are there, but pretend like they don't impact me anymore mm -hmm. and um, and really begin to deal with those things. Um, can, you, can you kind of talk about that that process and and like um, and people kind of ignoring or excusing their trauma? Because you probably see that a lot. Don't oh, you? yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, they dismiss it. Right. Because they they that's their protection. Yeah. Um, if we have something really horrible happen to you as a child, you just kind of take it on as like this is my reality. As a right. child, you, you're kind of stuck with whatever you've got. And so um, there's a process of dissociation that goes on with younger children. Um, something something as bad is happening. They create their own little world. And so they dissociate from reality in that way. They create their own reality. And it's a coping mechanism. They're, they're uncomfortable. Um, so they do that. And, and there's, a, there's a lot of different outcomes that can, that can happen there um, as you grow and you get older, uh, you take that skill set on of that dissociation and you take it on as an adult. And so we compartmentalize, we ignore, we don't, we don't want to really face our tragedies uh, because what are you going to do about it? And as men, you know, we don't, we don't talk about things because what's the point? You know, it happened. That was then, this is now, let's move on. And so, you know, it depends on the person and the tragedy and what happened, if it's ongoing or if it was at a young age. But, I mean, you name it, uh, sexual molestation at two or three or four years old that's continual you know, for years. It's very difficult to talk about. Yeah. You know, what are you going to say? Uh, you got a father who is physically beating you or beating mom um, in front of you continually, you know, repeatedly. 
what are you going to say? You know, well, my mom, my, my, my parents' marriage wasn't good. That's what I hear. Yeah. You know, something like that. So they'll, they'll move away from the reality of whatever it is that's, that's wrong and try to make it palatable for them. But see, it causes you to become very uncomfortable, and that's what you're medicating with drugs and alcohol is, is discomfort. So, okay, so you're, that's your coping mechanism. Go ahead and use that. That's fine. I mean, unless it's going to kill you immediately while I'm trying to help you understand that, that you're, what are you coping with? So it's not that I'm dealing with the, the problem being the usage but the problem is the trauma. And, and once you get to that and you can get to that in a safe place, mm -hmm. then you can really start healing. I, you know, from a scriptural standpoint, it's, it's the enemy is going to win if you let the enemy in. Right. So I'm battling this enemy and, um, mm -hmm. I know you're going to bring it up about how the, you know, <laughs> my use of, of, of faith, but, um, it's like, I'm battling the enemy, and the enemy is addiction, but addiction is really not the enemy. We know who the enemy is, right? Yep. Addiction is the tool. And so I, I, the person who has the problem, they are not the problem. They're being attacked. And I've said this in, in, in countless times in other uh, podcasts and things I've done and in my practice. It's like, you know, if you're the addict and you're sitting in front of me, it's like, you're okay. Like, you're a good person. Oh, they don't like to hear that. But it's like you have a problem, and the problem is you're being attacked. They never, they never think of that. Like, really, you know. And and so, trying to get them to to heal is a matter of addressing what's really wrong with them. And and there's a lot of things that you have to do to get to that place. But it's it's a lot of hard work. Yeah, and I think a lot of people will dismiss the addict stuff because they're like, "Well, I'm not doing drugs, and I'm not, I'm not drinking alcohol." Mm -hmm. um, matter of fact, it came up with us um, in some of our times together. Yeah, where it's like, well, people bring their kids to me, or their their young adult children, um, their you know, and say, hey, you need to talk to them um, because they're they're an addict, they're strung out on drugs, and right. we kind of know your story, and uh, and people think that. Man, because I sold drugs, I was addicted to drugs. Man, I wasn't, which we talked about, I wasn't addicted to drugs. It, it was other things that I didn't think I was addicted to, like the sex and the power and the attention and, and, and stuff like that. I think even when you talk about like kids will um, um, disconnect and try to live in a fantasy world, I think we're still doing that as adults with social media oh, and, sure. and other things. Oh, absolutely. And we're addicted to it, man. And a sure sign of it is when someone wakes up in the morning and that's the first thing they look at. Well, you and I sitting here, I mean, we're talking, right? But this is going to be seen by people who are not connected to us, you know, in this room. Right. So we're not real. Like we're virtual. In that reality, we're virtual. So we're not real. And, and people use that as a coping mechanism, right, to escape reality. There's yeah. a voice in the ear, you know. Yeah, and uh, I think um, I think there's a lot more people. Um, again, I don't. I'm not. I haven't ran a poll or anything like that. There's a lot more people battling with addiction than they realize. Well, okay. So, for, all right. Let's define addiction now. See, that's part of the problem. It's like I use something to cope. Mm -hmm. So addiction is a term that's it's not a clinical term, first of all. Substance use disorder. Good, that's good to know. Yeah, um, addiction. And it would, actually the, the APA, the American Psychological Association, they're, they're trying to move everybody away from using the word addict or, you know, it's like you're not an addict because that's a bad word. It's a, it's a negative connotation label, right? But addiction. So what is addiction? I need to feel better. So I, I use something to feel better. So it, for me, that's addiction. You don't have to go into physical withdrawal from, from your drug of choice. And certainly you're not going to do that from a lot of things that you could shopping. You're not going to go into a physical withdrawal from that. But is it addiction? You know, is, are you using something to cope with feeling uncomfortable instead of dealing with how you feel or, or afraid to or not having the tools, right? So that's, that's your tool. So for me, that's addiction, right? I'm using food. something to cope. Food, yeah. Mm. 
social people liking your stuff posting you know that like because i you know i see it all the time with with people who you know reject rejection is a big thing mm -hmm. <laughs> it's it's huge in um, our narcissistic society today yes it's, yes it's a, it's a weapon and so you know you post continually because you need the likes or you need the the comments or you need whatever to inflate your self-esteem that has been artificially inflated through the self-esteem movement and so you you haven't earned the self-esteem you just received it yeah this is getting good already <laughs> i love this <laughs> right and uh and man we i think you know it i think that's a it's prevalent, man. I see it in church too all the time. Like people, this is something that shifted in me too, man. People want to climb the church ladder too. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, oh yeah, and, I see it. Yeah. And, and it's like, man, I think that's been one of the most beautiful things uh, about this season. People haven't known how to take this year with me. Th this is a God thing too, because when I started this year, um, I felt inclined to a direction. I felt like God was going to do something significant. I had no idea how to put words on it or anything. I didn't realize the freedom that was going to come in completely letting God take what I thought was real and just kind of tear it down in a sense. Um, not that there wasn't anything real in my life. There's a lot of real, I think there was just a lot of things being avoided that I didn't, um, there's some bridges that needed to be crossed. And I think this year I felt like God was going to do that for other people. I was like, man, I really feel like there's going to be some significant maturity within our church. Right. Dude, no, it wasn't for, I mean, maybe it has happened for our church. That was a word for me. <laughs> it was for me. And, you know, and, and I was living in this bubble where everything was processed through the lens of being a a church leader in a community to serve others, right? Yes, and that can be, and you can get lost in that focus of serving others, and you think that somehow that's your messaging of like, I I feel like I need to do these things for others. So you get confused on that what can the become a coping is. mechanism, sure, and, and to not deal with your stuff. One of one of them, we didn't, I didn't plan to bring this up, but one of the things that uh, you and I talked about early on is like, man. I always want to ask guys like you talking about me when you said, what's really going on in your life? Like what, what happened to you? Cause you were like, man, nurses, you know, doctors, like, uh, emergency room people, police, firemen, like, man, those guys, pastors, mm -hmm. they turn into heroes or helpers. They want to save the day. And a lot of times it's because it couldn't save the day for themselves. They come from tragic backgrounds. Yes. That's that's a very common thing. Every it's funny because every time I see somebody that's really skilled in emergency room medicine, or if they're a nurse practitioner or a nurse or a PA or something, and they're working in that environment, or a fireman, or really like cool, got it together, police officer or a pastor or somebody, I want to rush up and give them my card. Go, you know what? You're doing an awesome job. You let me help you with what's going on with you because you you got some stuff in your past. You know, you're good at what you do, and there's a reason. Which is exactly what you did with me this year. <laughs> you were like, you came, you, and let me just let you guys know, Jock was like, he's one of those guys, He when he talks, it's, it's good. But at first, he just listens and listens really, really well, and, uh, and, then, and then offers himself to you, like, hey, you know, if you ever need anything, man, I'd love to talk with you or, or whatever. And that's exactly what he was doing with me when he first met me. He's like, yeah, this dude's helping people, but he, he probably needs some help himself. It's, it's, it, when somebody is using discernment, it's very uh, unbalancing to the person who's on the receiving end of that. That's happened to me um, a, a couple of times. You know, somebody looks at me and they're like, and they say the same thing. Like, y you know, I'm here if you want to talk, you know, and then they start telling you something that you don't think that they know, you know. I'm going to start doing that when... Oof. Every, every Tuesday when we talk, I'm like, hey, Jack, I'm here. If you yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, like we don't like, so this year, like I started this year with this idea of like the church or the community. When I say the church, not right. I'm talking about a building or, um, or even necessarily organizationally, I'm talking about 
the people. Like, mm -hmm. all right, you know, the, the, and people might watch this years down the road. So we're talking about 2022 right now. Um, it is uh, definitely baptized by fire year for me, like in the fire. Um, and I had, like, we started an eight month uh, track with men for discipleship. And, and it started with, at the time, I didn't know it was step four of the 12 step program. It's that moral inventory, like, hey, everything that holds you back, like yeah. that. All those character you, defects. Write it down. You know what I'm saying? That sin that you've never confessed. The ugly. Yep. All yeah. the stuff that you yeah. run and hide from, but it'll pop up and it'll hinder um, how you lead your family, how, how you follow Jesus, if you want to be honest. That was session one for eight with men over an eight-month period of time. Mm -hmm. So I, I did it too. Like I did it. And I tried to make my wife my confessional. Oh, <laughs> like, that's, hey, let's... that's not a good move. Well, the, the be <laughs> it wasn't. But the beautiful thing was like, my wife's like, when I married you, I knew you had a bad past. I don't need to know it. Right. Like, we're good. I love you. Yeah. And so I was like, well, I appreciate that. But a lot of what we, what we hit in the middle of the year with me personally was like, man, in this process, man, it, it really, it just kind of removed um, some of the blinders. Like, man, something's not right. Why, why, why do I pastor a church um, and I'm not enjoying it? Why, why am I questioning a lot? Not, not necessarily my faith, but um, why do I feel inadequate? Why do I feel like I have to achieve? Why am I struggle with comparison? Just all these insecurities, and they just mm -hmm. kept coming and coming and coming. And I was like, man, what in the world is going on? It was overwhelming. And I was trying to figure out how to articulate that to the church, but I didn't even know how to articulate it, period. Right. And so I just really told the church, and a lot of the church was like, man, hey, what's going on? I just like, I need time. I need space. I need... I need to navigate whatever's going on inside of me. I can't run from this. I can't hide from this. Like it, like a change of scenery isn't going to fix this. That's a lot of times when when we feel an internal thing. Right. We want to change something right. externally. Right. And that'll that'll fix it for a short period of time. And but then you're still you land back with the yeah, same issues. Yeah, you just issues. rewrap the package, but the package is still the package. Exactly. Yeah. And so I, here I was in the summer filling this, and um, really it was Father's Day, full-fledged panic attack in front of the whole congregation. Yeah. I was like, man, what is going on, right? Yeah. I had no reason to, to, that, to wait, be that. No, that's not true. So well, you did I thought have I had no reason. Yeah. You believed that there was nothing causing this. I couldn't see it. So right. I was like, what, this doesn't, this doesn't make sense. Right. And so, you know, I, didn't, I couldn't put a time stamp on it. I was talking mm -hmm. to the board, talking to the church, like, dude, I can't, I can't say this starts here and it ends here. When I thought it started like Father's Day, it actually probably started way before then. I didn't realize it until it really started manifesting that way, which is why I called you. Yeah. And was like, hey, not only you, I had another counselor as well. And, and just started talking to mentors. I was like, hey, I need help navigating this. But I found in my conversation with you, first off, um, you, let me say this to people. You have a really good counselor if they bother you sometimes. Like if you're like, man, I feel like they're pushing me and trying me a little bit, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Like, let me say it. This is a better way to say it. If your counselor doesn't ever make you a little uncomfortable, like with with causing you to to dive in a little deeper right i personally think you might need to look at maybe a a, a second opinion um because um because a good counselor will challenge you like like you just they speak did. the truth exactly right like you just did when you're like oh, i didn't have a reason you're like you know you didn't mm -hmm. you know i don't know how many hundreds of times you probably have been like whoa <laughs> wait wait with me and uh the other thing i found that marks a good counselor is somebody who actually listens that's something um um you and i at the beginning man you heard me but then you told me you heard me i wasn't really sure how to respond to that especially with the openness and the vulnerability like i was like man i don't really know how to handle this or like what do i say thank you <laughs> you know like how do i like so i sit there with this puzzled look and you told me you're like this happens all the time mm-hmm because people are scared to share 
some things, then they feel safe enough and they share it and then they're heard and they're still accepted. People don't know how to respond to that. No. Right. And that's uh, the, the words I hear from men are uh, particularly military um, is this is, you know, you created a safe space. Like this office is a safe space. That's those are the words I hear, specific words, safe space. They didn't feel that before. They didn't have that experience. And, you know, there's a there's a lot of different theoretical orientations in psychology and, and mental health. And, you know, you, you, to be a good therapist, you have to subscribe to one, right? And then really study it and know it and master that. You, you can't be eclectic. It's, you're not going to be successful. So uh, one of my mentors, but without him knowing he's a mentor because he doesn't know who I am and I've never spoken to him, Dan <laughs> Siegel, Dr. Siegel. Um, Dan Siegel is a guy who uh, interpersonal neurobiology is his – his theory that he he and some others have come up with. But his ex explanation of that is that therapy, the therapeutic healing and the connection happens in the space between you and me. It doesn't happen in me. It doesn't happen in you. It's the space between us. And that space between us hmm. is experienced and established by feeling felt. Like you feel felt. And that he used that description from one of his patients that he had for a long time. She said, you know, you, you really made me feel felt. And that's important. And it's really important when you have a trauma background because you don't think anybody's going to understand. And I, I just can't even begin to tell you the, the depth of horrors that are revealed in my presence in my office that are just, it's just horrific, the things that people have gone through. And they, many times, it is the first time they've ever revealed it. And I'm talking about somebody who's like 40 or 50 or 60 years old. I had a 68-year-old woman who described something that she had never spoken about that happened to her when she was three and four and five. Mm. How do you get to 68? And she'd been hospitalized in mental health facilities. She'd been in counseling for years. She came into my office and she revealed this. And it's like, you've never said that before, have you? She goes, no. And the question is like, why? Safe space, feeling felt, you know. I, to, so that, that ability to connect the humanity, uh, that connection between two humans is really where the magic happens in, in a therapeutic process. Um, and when you're the person who people are leaning on, like you're describing yourself, you know, it's like people are leaning on you. Now you now only, not only are you not going to be able to understand your own stuff or be able to spend the time on it, but now you're taking on other people's stuff. But that's a great distraction, isn't it? It's like I don't yes. have to deal with my stuff then, right? And that's why, you know. And I I was a lifeguard and an EMT, and you know now I'm a counselor and I had my past, you know. Well, this is a distraction. I'm I'm helping other people, so that's helping me. No, it's not. Right. You know. It's just delaying. I mean. Y yeah. You know. And that, that's, that's been the beauty of this year and the journey is like, I actually feel like, man, um, without getting distracted, I've actually turned, first off, I'm not a good, I'm not you. I'm not gifted in the counseling realm at the capacity someone like you are, right? Like when people come in and they need counsel, it's pretty black and white for me. Like, mm -hmm. hey, marriage counseling. Well, we're having marital issues. All right, cool. Let's talk about it, right? <laughs> All right, what's going on? Well, he's been cheating on me. Sweet, we can fix this right now. Stop cheating on her. Right, problem Here's solved. Problem solved. <laughs> can we go to Chick-fil-A? And in my office, the question would be like, okay, yeah, I'd say the same thing. It's like, can make a commitment to this marriage. Right. You made a commitment in front of God and your relatives and everybody else. So abide by that commitment or get out. You can't do both, right? Problem solved. Okay, now, me, therapist, next yep. question. I look at the guy and I say, why are you cheating? Like what? What happened? What did mom have issues with you, or did dad? What What, what happened? <laughs> you know, it's like that's uncomfortable, as opposed to the message of you made a vow before God that you were going to be faithful, right? Right, and you're breaking that, so you must stop that. But right. Why is he doing that? You know what? Ha what? What's that about? And that's the difference between therapy and it pastoral counseling, right? Right. And a good pastor that counsels well 
knows how to do that to some degree to to dive in. Mm-hmm. For me, man, it's and we live in a culture that um, we're trying to really get away from just the idea of the behavior modification to mm-hmm. to say, man, this is this is what a Christian looks like. Like I, man, I think that's the beautiful thing of of following Jesus. Okay, first off, I'll say this too. Let me, before I dive into this, people that don't know you when they initially meet you, they might think you are much more secular than you are. Oh, because I'm a therapist. Right. Oh, yes. But I I know you well enough that I can say this with complete confidence that you are 100% a ninja in the kingdom (laughs) because you use scripture and you don't, you won't even tell people you're using scripture. Yeah, like, no, no. You, you'll use it and you'll help navigate it and uh, navigate stuff with people through scripture sometimes. Yeah. And they don't even realize, like, it's like, oh, hold on, you know. That's Wait. why, that's why I have a copy of uh, Robert Peterson's The Message because it's it written in a language that they wouldn't get. I'll even get the thing out and I'll, I'll open it up and I'll start reading from Proverbs once in a while. They don't even know what I'm looking, what I'm reading from, right? They don't yeah. get it. Yeah. Yeah, we've had stories of prodigal and different things, and yeah. and uh, and it's it's been cool. But anyway, what I was saying is, man, when I look in the Gospels, like the beautiful thing about Jesus, and even in the Book of Acts, like, man, we've created this culture where church is just supposed to be so clean and perfect, and and what it becomes is like, um, it becomes unauthentic when we do that. Um, yeah, there is a level of holy, like God brings holiness and it goes from glory to glory. But man, I really don't think you can actually see a lot of that until you're really honest. Mm-hmm. And I think about the people that Jesus knew the worst of people and interacted with them and loved them. He called Zacchaeus, who people didn't like. Zacchaeus was insecure. He stole from people. He calls him out of a tree, he goes to his home. He fellowships with them in his home. It's just like this, the the woman at the well, multiple husbands living with a guy that wasn't even her husband. She's at the well at an hour that, that, and she's Samaritan at that. She like, he's breaking. Not even liked. Yeah. Yeah. Like he's breaking like racial barriers by talking to her, gender barriers. And then she's at the well at an hour that no other women are there. Why? probably because of the shame and the guilt and, and the, the yeah, social issues, talk, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Jesus is hanging out with her, completely transforming the whole idea of what it looks like to be a Christian. Man, and I love it. And and I've been in this idea of, man, just fix problems, modify behavior, right? Right. And instead of, well, hold on, can we just dig a little deeper and accept what we're going to find? And then allow God to meet us in that and begin just this healing transformational work. Dude, I think that's the beauty, man, of, of following Jesus. And then like that whole scripture, right? Confess your sins to one another, right? Talks about the healing, right? Right. Talks about the, the, the righteous man's prayer. It's like, dude, dude, are we people that actually can confess the deepest, darkest and, and I think the church should be a safe place. It's I think it was intended to be a safe place, and I don't think it happens a lot in the church because it hasn't been a safe place. And I think for me to lead a church that creates a safe place, I had to find a safe place. Mm-hmm. And uh, and that's the beauty in finding a counselor. Let's talk about this for a quick second too. Dudes don't like counseling. No, no, they don't want to. They don't want to talk. They don't want to talk. Why? What do you think is why? Because we're supposed to be leaders and um, not followers, so we're supposed to be strong, right? And so if you're talking, that's a sign of weakness, you know? You have to talk about this because you couldn't muscle through it. And and so we're raised, at least in our society and in a lot of Western societies, uh, you know, walk it off, rub some dirt on it, just get over it, stop crying, you know, muscle through it. And that's that's the messaging they get from as a child and as fathers. You know, you're a father, I'm a father. That message, we have to temper that, you know, if we're aware of that being a problem. But then again, we want our sons and our daughters to be able to survive in society as it is, right? So we, we walk a fine line with that if we're aware that that's a problem. But, but you do that because that, you know, if you talk, if you rehash things, A, 
we're very linear, right? So mm -hmm. problem, solution, options, pick one, implement, evaluate, move on. Yep. Right? Women don't do that. They're circular. <laughs> so they'll, the, you know, problem, solution, options, go talk to the girls, come back, think about it. Oh, it's related to this other one. And they kind of move. They're moving forward just like we are, but they do it in a different way. Right. Group, group think, consensus, that kind of thing. Men don't do that. S strong, independent, and so then they're successful. So if you're talking about your problems and you're a man, you're weak. And so I can't do that. And, and so talking to another man is particularly challenging because you're revealing your, your, your flaw, but the reception by the other guy, is the, that reception is important. Like you can't say, well, just get over it. What's the problem, right? Because now you're just reinforcing that same stereotypical message. So when you're um, in, in a therapeutic process, uh, to be able to get things out of men, for me, is, is I have to use a different method. Um, I, I, went, I, I knew this couple uh, that were doing some pastoral work with me and my wife, and uh, the, the couple realized what I did, and they talked to me about it, and the guy that was talking to me was a former federal SWAT officer, high-risk uh, search warrants and, and retrieval of, of felons. And he had quit his job. And um, he was very like, you know, he's very much that tough guy, but now he's basically doing pastoral marriage counseling kind of things. And um, he looked at me and he said, you know, you're, you're Moses. <laughs> and I'm like, what? He goes, like, you're Moses. Anger and everything. Uh, you know, let my people go. Like leading, leading them and being in that space as, as a male counselor where you can hold that space with a male client and, and make them feel something, you know, hmm. bring something out of them that is something they don't want to talk about because they were molested, uh, because they were abandoned, because mom was uh, physically abusing them, something like that. And if you talk about that, that's weakness. But what are you going to do with it when you talk about it? What Now what? Okay, I told you this, now what? And that's where that... The, the, the idea of healing comes in, especially from a scriptural standpoint. Being able to authentically talk to somebody and connect with them right. is important um, because you have to heal. But the healing is being able to hold space with them, not react, you know, just be there genuinely with them. And you, you, you describe it as being like, I'm, I'm listening to you. And what I'm doing is I'm connecting with you. I'm being there in that space of, of tragedy with you. Well, in a culture of, you know, we escape present, we're here, but we're not here. Like when you find something that's actually like, okay, or find a relationship or dialogue where you're like, hey, we're not checking our phones. Mm -hmm. We're not watching everything else around us. We're not in our mind 16 other places, but I'm actually right here. Like that's pretty significant, you know, and that's, um, that's, that's a very lost art in our culture it today. It is today, yeah. Yeah, and um, and it's pretty profound. And I remember, you know, I was invited into counseling in 2015. I really needed it. Like, I, I really did. Man, I was, I was scared to death. Like, I was like, dude, what is this going to be like, you know? Do I lay on a couch? Like, you know, you're, <laughs> you're, you're anxious about the weakness right. of the moment. And, uh, and... Man, it is so freeing and liberating, especially as a dude, to find somebody you can be honest with, expose your weakness, begin the process of healing and living with and dealing with things, right? Mm -hmm. um, and um, my, my, my thing is, I feel like you're not, I'm glad you're not weird, okay? Because I think a lot of guys think that counselors are weird. Because well, they are. <laughs> it's I'm, true. No, no, no. You're not weird. All right. Don't no, you but a, lot, a lot of my colleagues, yes. Are weird. And, and perhaps people would maybe think I was weird, but yeah, no, it's a common quirky. That's the word I use, quirky. Quirky is a good word, uh, right? Yeah. yeah. But I'm like, man, <laughs> like, I think it's really good for a guy to find a counselor that, um, well, it depends on the guy. So I shouldn't say this. I shouldn't generalize. Um, I think a guy like me, I think it's good to find a a guy like you that can can be a tour guide, dude, 
your past. Like, hey, man, I'm, I'm going to walk through it with you, like mm -hmm. help you navigate some of this. You, you know things that I don't know. So you help expose things. You have a different perspective. Like God's wired you, trained you, taught you to help me see things in a different way, which is awesome. But I also feel like if somebody walked into our counseling session and wanted to get in a fist fight with us, I don't feel like you'd run away. I feel like you'd help me in a fist fight. And so <laughs> could take a punch. I'm like, okay, this is <laughs> this is good, you know, that you have a guy uh, like that. Um, I want to completely demystify the whole idea of counseling being something that's lame, um, that's weird. It like it it really, if you have a good counselor, I think it's huge. I want to say this too, man. Like if anybody from another church is listening uh, or another pastor, like I would strongly encourage you if you're a lay leader or just in a church, support your pastor in his idea of pursuing a counselor and having one for himself. It doesn't mean that he's relying on God less. It's, it's actually like we're a body. God has wired us to help each other. Yeah. If you're a pastor, man, I wouldn't even hesitate. I wouldn't balk. I'd put it in the budget, whatever you need to do. Because I feel like um, you've helped me navigate some things in my life that is going to change how I lead the church in a better way, like for the better. Mm -hmm. And like, man, why wouldn't you support that, like in a church? Well, that's, you know, I, I, I've, I work with other pastors too. Um, and what I've heard from them is that there, there's a concern because they don't know uh, within the community the whatever they're revealing to another person, it doesn't feel safe, right? Because they they are the pastor. And so the pastor is supposed to be pure and and uh, healed and centered and focused. And you're, you're a man. We're supposed to have the answers for everyone else. Right. So you shouldn't have flaws. And, and the same is true with, with, you know, like your physician. You wouldn't want your physician to be a medical mess, right? It's like you can't even heal yourself. What? <laughs> so, uh, but but that ability to connect in a way that's genuine and authentic and and safe. That's the you know that's just word is very important. It's safe because what you're going to uh, open up to other people in a therapeutic process is one where you're revealing stuff that's not good, and probably your reaction to it wasn't good either. Right. Right. Um, and there's lots of different examples I could give you of that, but um, they experienced something, their reaction was bad, maybe they started, you know, having sex, or they were addicted to pornography, or they were, you know, they started shooting up heroin. And you don't want, you know, somebody to be somebody that you're relying on, who has that kind of an unstable background, you think. On the reverse side of that coin, though, we love redemption. We love to hear like the horrible tragedy that happened that somebody yep. overcame and they're healed. You know, whether it's the lost boys of the Congo or the prostitute who becomes the pastor or uh, the Hells Angels uh, chapter president who becomes a pastor with his wife. There's one of those guys around. Actually, there's two of them. Um, and we love that because it's like, wow, God really has walked in your life and healed you. That's awesome. How did you, you know? I'm going to listen to you. I'm going to believe what you tell me because you walked it. Right. And there are those stories. But at the same time, if yours is, it's your story. And, you know, you were, you were left with a babysitter who was sexually molesting you. And you told your parents when you were three and four and five. And your parents just ignored it and just kept bringing that babysitter over. You're not, that's not, that's your story. You don't want, you know, that's one that you feel like you can't get over. So you don't want to talk about it. Right. And it's embarrassing. So walking with with healing is really one where you're walking with faith. And that's where you really have to, you know, you have to believe that you have the armor of God on you, you know, to be able to do that, to, to be open about it. Yeah. And and I think um, for me particularly, like I've always felt like I've embraced the brokenness and the the tragedy. Well, hanging out with you, it's like, well, maybe you haven't quite as much as you think you have. And so now we we've did we've um engaged on some of that deeper work to to deal with that. But I think um part of the issue is is in a culture where 
pastors, you know, like you kind of like you're saying, we see the tragedy, we see the redemption, people idolize that, glorify that, right? And sometimes it'll put people in a position that people aren't supposed to sit. I think um, I think it's totally cool. Like I'll honor everybody, honor up, down, all around. But as a pastor, like I'm not Jesus. Mm-hmm. I, I'm just following Jesus. And I think when we permit pastors and leaders to be broken and to be honest and to lead from that position and support them, right? Like um, I think a lot of people think if you're a pastor, you should have arrived. There, there is some place where you need to be. <laughs> I, mm-hmm. Not everybody should be permitted to, to, to do it, depending on where they are spiritually, like mature from a maturity standpoint. I've questioned a lot with myself over eight years. Um, but I think, man, having a house, a church house, a, a body, a believer that is real enough to allow even leadership to walk through stuff. Mm-hmm. I think it's huge. I think it's freeing. I think it's liberating. I think um, I think it releases something in the rest of the congregation that say, okay, it's it's okay to walk into my walk-in closet to deal with these things, to throw my mask down. You know, everybody's story is unique and different, but most people have experienced trauma in some capacity. Mm-hmm. Um, and if it don't kill you, it makes you stronger. I don't know if I agree with that. If it doesn't kill you, it'll keep killing you until you deal deal with it. But see, you know, you're dismissing the dead people. That's the problem. If it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger. Well, what about the people that died? You know, people die in my practice all the time. I go to funerals. I hate it because the enemy is one. The enemy won, right? So when you say it doesn't, it, it'll make you stronger. The people who died, that implies that they're weak. You see, even the language we use to describe that's trauma right. is one that's based on failure and success and overcoming and walk it off and get over it. There, It's not that easy. That's the problem. And can we not forget what the Apostle Paul said? I boast in my weakness. Like he was, like he, I boast in it. Like he, he found a resting place in honesty, authenticity, in the struggle, you know? And we live in a culture, too, that dismisses that from the Christian world. Like when you come to Jesus, right, he like everything gets super perfect. Everything is super good. good. Like, man, I come to God. And it's like, dude, go, please, please go find that, you know, in Scripture where like everything was right. Your bills were always paid on time. You always had everything. You never got sick. Like, go, please go find that in Scripture and show that to me. You can't. Yeah. Because all the greatest all of the greatest in Scripture when it comes to God struggle mightily. And Jesus tells us, man, hey, in this world you're going to have troubles, but take heart because I've overcome the world, right? Well, God gave us this one gift that screws everything up. It's called free will. <laughs> you know, you can do what you want. There's going to be a, a price, a penalty, a consequence, but you can do And I really marvel at that. It's like that one god-given thing that to me was like that would be interesting if we didn't have free will like we couldn't make decisions like that but we can and it's a great gift because you can use it for good or for evil and and when you're you're you know the example of using it for evil um you know i in in the in the uh 80s when i was was uh a younger man in my 20s i was was a kid I was a kid. I was born in the 80s. I just wanted to throw that out there. Thank you. (laughs) That hurts. (laughs) Uh, I was given the opportunity to be able to do, you know, drug running. I could run drugs. Cocaine was king then, right? And I was a guy who just was on my own. I didn't have really family attachments or anything, and I was pretty street smart. And I got offered the opportunity to run drugs, you know, from Miami to New York and back and forth up by I-95. I could have done that. I could have been, I probably would have made a lot of money doing it. But I'd be dead. But what is it, the free will? Like, I could have done that, but I decided not to. And God was working in my life in many ways, and I kept resisting against that That during that that uh, season of my life. And and um, But there were things that I wouldn't do. You know, yeah. there were things I would do. You know, I, I didn't mind pounding your face in. But then I felt bad, and I would go over and bandage you up. You know, it's like I, I just, it, there was something in me, there's this compassion that I kept kind of pushed down that I don't want to feel that. 
because I was so angry all the time uh, about my upbringing and my family. So I had the opportunity to do these things and I chose not to. So it changed the direction of my life, but I didn't do it with full knowledge of like, I'm doing it because it's just like, right. that's wrong. The message of that's wrong. And I, I, you know, we, we can choose to do what we want. And, and I deal with people all the time, every day in my practice, every day, you know, four or five, six, eight, ten 10 hours a day of people who free will choices. But I also question sometimes about how free that choice is. You know, you're reacting in pain. So you do things that are, that are not good, that are unhealthy, destructive. You know, you've walked that path. Yep. You know, you're given this and then you do this other thing that's counter to that. But then you keep coming back to this other thing that's the light. And then you go into the dark. One of my favorite proverbs um, is uh, you can pound on a fool all day long, but you can't pound out his foolishness. And, and you, so your willingness to accept what can be is that, you know, I'm, I'm going to reject that. That's the foolishness part. So I can, I can beat on you all day long, but if you want to free will make foolish choices, yes. But then it's like if you're going to make the wise choice or the good choice, you, that, that takes in a tremendous amount of strength, right? Because um, there's a chance that you might fail or you might not get whatever it is. So we, we make choices, but sometimes we don't. You get molested as a child, you're angry, you can't make connections and relationships because they're not safe, and so you drift away from trusting, willing relationships, and you move towards people who are untrusting because they're kind of what you think you deserve. And predictable, you know. Right. I'm familiar with that, so I know what to do with it. This other person who's not abusive, I don't trust that. That's, not, that's uncomfortable for me because they might betray me or something, right? So am I being a fool or am I being foolish? No, I'm just actually doing what I know because it's safe, so to speak, for me to do that. It's, a, it's abuse, but which, I don't know what to do with it. Which is why I believe having people in your circle that can counsel is incredible. And I'm talking about from an organi organizational standpoint right now. Having uh, guys on staff that are gifted in this in some realm um, maybe not at the capacity um, that you are, but they can help people mm -hmm. get a lay. But also as a pastor, keeping this available for not only my team, but for our church, something that's big that um, that we made a point to do, it's actually been a couple of years now, is, you know, people come to us and want us to walk into their, you know, free will choices, bad decisions, or even not only their bad decisions, but trauma, stuff that's been projected on them, things that they've been through. And uh, I never felt comfortable like, man, like I can actually show up and help people navigate their darkest days. Makes sense to me now. I haven't actually been able to do it on my own for myself. Mm -hmm. I've needed help, right? So what we've done for, for a while is we've made it a resource, something that's available through our church. Um, bringing in someone like yourself, um, uh, we have a guy in town uh, that I'm really close with, Mike Stapleton, who was a massive help to me in 2015, as well as uh, another, a female counselor here in town that we say, man, if people need help and it's outside of our capacity, our ability, to, right. we help make it available. And because you need, so, like when you come in stuff like that, when you grow up through stuff like that, like, hey, this person that, I should trust. We've we talked about this. Like me, any good relationship I was having growing up, I'd sabotage it because it scared me because it required that I'd have to trust somebody. Right. Because I had massive trust issues because right. of childhood trauma, right? Things that I'd been through. But you don't know the other side of that unless somebody can help you see it, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, hey, dude, you're responding this way because of this, because you've been honest. You felt safe. You've been honest. Someone like you comes in and says, hey, you're responding this way probably because of this. And so this is good, but you don't trust it because you haven't had a lot of good experiences in this. Bringing somebody in to help you see that is huge and then help you navigate it. Then also another good sign of a good counselor is there's a level of accountability. Like you, you'll often say, hey, I need you to go do this before we meet next time. Like, man.
man, I don't know if I would be as intrigued if every time it's like, okay, cool, I'll see you next week. Right. And but at least often you send like go do some homework. I know Mike Stapleton's really big. Mike Stapleton in 2015. Uh, I remember he said, if you come back next week and you haven't did this homework, you're wasting our time. Don't bother coming back till you do the homework. Yeah, I've, I've used that line a lot. <laughs> it's a great line. Um, got to go to a meeting. I don't want to go to a meeting. Well, if you don't go to two meetings, don't come back. And I want I want to see a sign-off sheet. You got to tell me that you were there. See, it, I, it brings a level of accountability, right. right? I think it's incredible to help people become aware and then start implementing some things that really change and set you free. So at our church, and I'm saying this because primarily people at our church are going to watch this. We've put it in the budget to be able to help people, Mm -hmm. right? To make sure, and we'll connect the dots. Yeah. But I find a lot of times people are hesitant because they don't, they don't really know Two, they, it's, it, it's an admit, they're admitting a weakness. Like I, I need help. Three, they say, this is what I get a lot. Oh, man, how much is it? You tell them how much it is. Like, oh, man, I don't want to pay that. But, I, you know, especially with marriage counseling, you know what all, my line is all the time? Divorce lawyer is going to be more expensive than this. A you lot know? more. But isn't it crazy, though? Like people will they'll want help but not want to invest in their own help? Well, because they think when, they, when they're looking for that help, they think, and typically, unfortunately, typically what you're describing is true. Like the, you come in, you sit down, you talk for 50 minutes, and you get up and you leave, right? And, and I've, had, I've had a licensed psychologist sit opposite me when I go in to see them as a client and say virtually nothing to, uh, with like no reaction. And I'm like, Okay, I know what theory you subscribe to, but this is the most unhelpful thing in the world. <laughs> what do you do? You know, I'm you. You gave me nothing. Again, it, it's personality and it's a lot of different factors when it comes to to connection with people, but it's the ability to hold space with a person and to be willing to walk wherever they are. You know, and for me, that's a scriptural directive I I take. Mm. Is I don't I don't go with the person who is healthy and the business owner and the successful politician and whatever, they don't need help. You know, they need, you find the pastor that's like, Hey, I think I'm about to quit, bro. It's all falling apart. <laughs> right. You know, the, I'll go anywhere with anybody. I literally will. And I have, uh, ask my wife, she it drives her nuts. You know, I'll get a phone call and she's like, you know, really, you're going to go there. You know, I will walk like, like I'm told that I'm supposed to do, like with the prostitutes and the lepers and the sick and the mm-hmm. poor and the thieves, you know, the, the apostles, they're all criminals, you know, a, a car, what did I hear? A carpenter, his girlfriend and his 12 criminal friends, you know, it's like, yeah, because those are the people that need the help. So I will go with you wherever you are going to go because I am fearless against the enemy that's attacking you. And if you have somebody in your life you can find somebody in your life that is willing to go to that and be brave and stand there with you and, you know, uh, proverbially, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Metaphorically, like hold your hand in that place where you are so afraid to be, right? Or you think no one will be there with you. That's what you need. And it doesn't have to necessarily be a therapist. It can just be somebody that will hold that space with you. Right. Fearlessly walk with you. Um and, and the person that's doing that is the person that has the strength that you at that moment don't have, you know, as the person who has been traumatized or whatever. And if you don't have that strength, you need to get that from somebody else. Okay, then find that person. It could be your spouse. It could be a friend. It could be some neighbor. It could be a pastor. It could be a counselor. It could yeah. be a psychiatrist. Like somebody that's not afraid to walk down that narrow, dark hallway that you walk down yourself and you get beat up every time. Well, see, this, that's, I want to have a church community that does that for each other. And I do understand there's different levels and different things. And sure. people have different experiences with, with different things. And, um, and so in whatever capacity we each can, um, I, I, I see my capacity growing because of my own personal experience with having someone do that with me personally. Mm-hmm. I want to make sure, too, though, that people understand like, it's okay to, to find a good fit. Make sure, though, a good fit isn't somebody that just 
makes you feel good or tells you what you want to hear. Um, I think I think you're really good at what you're at what you do because you're you're real, you're honest, um, but you don't say like the comfortable stuff. You put you put me in an uncomfortable situation to to deal with it mm-hmm. and not not to make me feel bad. Like you you've never like been like hey, do you feel like your life sucks right now? Good, that's what we we're hoping to achieve today. It's not that. It's like hey, let's, let's face whatever giant this is that maybe we were oblivious to even existing in your life. Right. You know? And so uh, I think a lot of people dismiss a counselor that challenges them, gives them homework, pushes them, puts them in uncomfortable situations. But there's a reason they do that. Like, And you know what's interesting is you put somebody in that position and um, you're, you're, you're almost fighting with them and then they come back the next week. <laughs> like they went through this horrible thing and then they come back at their appointed time the next week, ready to do it again and process it. Yeah. yeah. It's like, I, you know, I've, I've even had people like, you know, I'm going to tell you, I actually hate you, but I'm glad I'm here. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, good. You yeah. know, the, uh, something's happening. Good. <laughs> then later they're like, I don't know if I actually hate you anymore. Yeah. You give me, give me six months, you know, you'll, you'll come around. Exactly. <laughs> So I, I want to, we'll, we'll wrap, we'll land this plane because we've been going for a while with this, man. I, first off, thank you for what you do. Um, second off, man, um, you've impacted our church greatly and you've only been to it one time. Yeah. Um, because you, you've been a massive help to, to me. Um, but I want to make sure people feel encouraged. Like it's okay to find a counselor if that's what you need. Yeah, please, please go find one. And, and if Bold City is your home, we want to help you with that, whether it's a staff, pastor, um, and it's something that we're able to do. If not, we want to help you find one. We have some that we would recommend. Um, and if you can't afford it, like you actually can't afford it, okay? Some people tell you they can't afford it, but I'm like... Won't pay for it versus can't afford it. Exactly. Right. And uh, like we want to help. And and I'll, I'll do this with people too. I'll be like, well, how much do you have? You know, whether it's 50, 100, 150 bucks a session, whatever it is. And if they like, man, we could pay 40 or whatever, we'll we'll help. We don't care because right. we believe in that. And and a lot of people don't know that. Maybe a lot of churches don't do that. A lot they, of churches don't. They don't. No. Um, and a lot of people in our church don't know that we'll do that. But we actually plan to do it. And a lot of people think that the pastor should do all of that. That's correct. And I'm here to tell them today. You don't want me doing all that. No, you do not. And, and not, not just you. But no, no, no. You go ahead and say it. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, no, you definitely don't want Jason doing. No, you that. want Jason to talk to you, but you, you need a counselor to do the hard, hard lifting. Yeah, exactly. The emotional, and lifting. especially people that are geared and wired like you are that can handle that conversation, mm-hmm. set it down, and then pick it back up the next week when they meet with them again. Someone like me, I don't always do that. That stuff goes home because that could that could go on actually for years. Yeah, not just days. So yeah. that the, that's not fair to the pastor to to put that weight on them. Exactly. Yeah. And so, man, I want to encourage people um, to do that because it is it's changed my life for the better. Um, it's been uh, incredibly impactful, and it's cool to to know that these things have happened in my past and now understand. Hey, this is kind of why you respond. This is why you have these insecurities. This is why you struggle heal. with this, and be begin to heal from yeah. that. And those not just be things that have happened to me that I can but and say. But now look at me now, though. Like these are things that, you know, they happen. But I don't have to necessarily carry the bondage into the future. Right. Not that they even as a new creation in Christ, like you don't forget that stuff. But you don't let that hold you and sabotage your current relationships, the way that you operate now, right. the way that you live your life now. Right. You know. Also, I want to tell people with this, uh, tell people this that if they wanted to connect with you. You have a website. It is WellspringMindBody.com. There should be a handle that pops up if they wanted to to go there. You also have a podcast I out. Do. Yeah. And where, what is that called? Doc Jock, your addiction lifeguard. Yep, and yeah. where, where can they find that? Any platform, Spotify, Google, Apple, it's on uh, all of them. Dude, that's so awesome. Doc Chalk, your addiction lifeguard. Yeah. 
That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, thank you. I appreciate you hanging out yeah, with us. That was awesome, man. Thanks for having me. All right. Let's do it again soon. Okay. Thanks for tuning in to the Bold City Podcast. To learn more about us, visit us at boldcity.church or download the Bold City Church app. To support this ministry and help us continue to reach people all around the world, visit boldcity.church give.